Blog Talk Radio. Tennessee Sextet have worked toward since their inception. 
a ruthlessly honed album that refuses to compromise on brutality. It is also by far their most streamlined, atmospheric, and emotionally powerful release, pushing every aspect of their sound to the next level. The record grasps everything we have done thus far, states guitarist Alex Wade. It's got some of the elements from Whitechapel, released in 2012, but also some from A New Era of Corruption in 2010, and This Is Exile from 2008. It brings back the blast beats and really aggressive-sounding stuff from those earlier records, but it also has a lot of layers and some slower, more groove-oriented songs, which have become a big part of what we do. So without further ado, let's go into our first Metal Massacre Spotlight song for the evening. Once again, the name of the band is Whitechapel. The CD is Our Endless War. The song is Worship the Digital Age.
welcome back. You just heard Whitechapel from their CD, Our Endless War. The song was Worship the Digital Age. Make sure to stay tuned throughout the rest of the episode as we will be featuring two more songs from Whitechapel during this episode. Make sure to head on over to Metal Blade Records. Find out what the latest is on the band, touring information, merchandise, their CDs, all the other great bands that are on the label. So coming up in about 20 minutes, we are going to have Hank, Branks, uh, Hank Braxton, Ron Carlson, and Ivana Korab of A Natural On, part of the After Dark 8 Films to Die For, which come out on October 16th in select cities everywhere and on VOD. But before that, ladies and gentlemen, it is time once again for some digital dismemberment. <laughs> dismemberment spotlight for the evening we are going to be covering cult epics blu-ray release of angst a film by gerard cargill this is a film that has been very very hard to find very obscure film so to speak I'll give you a little bit of background information angst Photographed by legendary Oscar-winning Polish animator, experimentalist, Zbig Rybininski, I hope I pronounced that right, and scored by Krautrock synth god Klaus Schultz from Tangerine Dream, is one hell of a gorgeously stylized and shockingly visceral experience, a forgotten classic on the fringes of the slasher cycle. Edwin Lur, also of Das Boot and Schindler's List, plays a maniacal killer based on the real-life serial murderer Werner uh, Kinsick. As he stalks through the bland Viennese countryside, Schultz's music pulses darkly, and Zbig's innovative first-person camera work grabs you by the throat, never letting go. Angst, also known as schizophrenia, is one film that, without any empty hyperbole we can guarantee you'll never ever forget cult epics presents for the f- presents for the first time since its original release the uncut uncensored version optically restored tunnel murder scene in hd with painstaking bonus features including a new interview with erwin erwin letter an interview with director gerald cargill conducted by george B- budegret of necromantic and an introduction by Gaspar No, director of Irreversible, Enter the Void, and Love, who cited Angst as an influence, one that I have watched more than 40 times. <clears throat> to give you a little bit of background info so that this makes sense, again, as it was stated, this story is based loosely on the story of serial killer uh, Warner Kinsk. Now, this guy was in trouble from his youth uh, up until he committed his his crimes, and the tone is very similar to what is in the film. In fact, there are just a few details that are changed, uh, some of the aspects of the murders uh, and a few of the small details. But needless to say, this guy was was profoundly disturbed, and like most serial killers, a lot of it can be traced back or a lot of the circumstances can be traced back to his childhood. Certainly not to make an excuse for the misery that Werner put upon his victims, but just to give you that kind of background. So there are are two versions, quote-unquote, of the film. Um, You can just watch the – or three, actually. You can watch the film just straight – play it. There is an introduction by uh, Gaspar Noe uh, that kind of tells you what he thought of the influence, and he actually prefers the French video release. He feels like uh, with the dubbing 
and all of that, it gives you more of an insight into the killer's psyche, almost like you're more inside of his mind than, than what you are in the version that you watch. And then there is a prologue, which is kind of uh, voiced over, think along the lines of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre in a sense, and this actually gives, uh, shows you a scene where the character, and this his name is not Werner, you're never given the killer's name, but for the sake of argument, we will we will use Werner, <clears throat> where he goes up to a house and shoots a lady, and then you hear like a policeman or a psychologist in the background discussing kind of the case and the events in his life that sort of led up to this, which eventually leads to the beginning of the film. And um, what what you see is before he's about to be released from prison again. And a few days before his official release, he is given leave to go and find a job so that he has something to do when he gets out of prison. And the whole film, there's there's no – there's maybe five or six scenes of dialogue, and even then it's not any kind of extensive dialogue. For the most part, it's almost like you're hearing the internal thoughts or the monologue of the killer. So he's talking mostly about, you know, why he's in, you know, why he was in prison and that he has some kind of master plan that he wants to carry out in full detail. Uh he goes to a diner that's nearby and he sees two young ladies in there and an older man and an older woman running it and he's running his plan through his mind. He leaves, he hails a cab and he he has thoughts of actually murdering the cab driver by strangling her with a shoelace, and she reminds him of his first girlfriend, who was an older woman, uh, a much older woman than him, who could have been his, you know, the same age of, as his mother. And she used him for a lot of sadomasochistic type sexual things, which he grew, you know, to enjoy and like. Well, the cab driver suspects something fishy is going on and stops the cab. In a panic, he leaves the cab and just basically runs out through the woods, and he eventually stumbles upon a house that's just kind of in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by woods and a park and all that. He breaks into the house, not sure if anyone even live, lives there at this current point. Inside, he finds uh, uh, a grown man who's uh, basically wheelchair-bound and appears to be of some uh, mentally handicapped in some sense. So he explores the rest of the house, and is, and quote-unquote, as his luck would have it, uh, the mother of the wheelchair-bound gentleman and his sister both arrive home from shopping. In, in a Blitzkrieg type of attack, he... He grabs the daughter and, and ties her up and upends the young man in the wheelchair and attacks the, the mother, strangling her, but you know, it can't kill her. Uh, all the whole time, his internal monologue is discussing his plan and what, he, what it is that he wants to do. At this point, I should mention that what's, to me what was really unique and experimental about this film was how the cameras worked. It was almost like uh, the actor – had a rig attached to him, and I think at several points he did. So a lot of times you're getting a straight-on view of either what he's seeing or what his victims are seeing. So that that tends to end uh, to lend towards the grittiness and the realisticness of this film. He eventually kills the brother. The mother dies uh, unexpectedly in a way that he does not want. He is left with the girl. Now, in the real-life murders, he basically keeps the girl hostage and tortures her for several hours before murdering her and performing necrophilia with the body. And that does happen in the film, but not quite at the length that the real-life crime went with. He spends the night in the house sleeping next to the corpses, and the next day he decides he's going to take the bodies with him. He winds up getting caught because in, in all of his panic, he winds up hitting a car parked out uh, right down the road. Um, at that point in real life, the police are called, and they open the trunk, and they find the bodies. In the film, 
he continues to go on and goes back to the diner, his uh, odd behavior attracts the attention of the people inside, and eventually the police show up, and they find the bodies in the trunk. It's a very gripping psychological film. It's very interesting to see it entirely from the killer's perspective, and he's very unapologetic about it. He seems to be very matter-of-factly as you hear the story being told while everything's going on in real time. And I think that's another interesting aspect of the film is that everything is happening in real time. The only time that there's a difference is, of course, when he falls asleep and wakes up the next day. But other than that, it's pretty much a straight-on real-time murder as it happens. The special features on this are absolutely stunning. Once again, cult epics needs to be commended for everything that comes with this set. Of course, we have a new high-definition transfer and a new HD trailer. There's a new DTS HD MA 5.1 surround sound track. Of course, I had mentioned the optional playback with or without the prologue. And there's the introduction by Gaspar Noe. There's a featurette, uh, Irwin Letter and Fear, and, and I found that to be quite interesting. I, I was aware of his other films, but I haven't really seen any of it. But it was interesting to hear his take on the character and, and how he played it. There's uh, a lot of interesting dialogue there for sure, and fans that are either fans of this movie or people that have been looking for this film over the years will find a lot of interesting info there. It was interesting to get into his mind on how he was playing this whole thing. There's also an interview with director uh, Gerald Cargill uh, that's done by George Boudigret. Again, a, a lot of, of interesting interesting stuff there. Anything you want to know about this film is pretty much covered. There's an interview with the cinematographer, and I God, I hope I pronounce his name, Zygmunt Rebininsky, I hope. There's audio commentary with Gerald uh, Cargill, conducted by film critic Marcus Stiglager. The most interesting point in all this, I believe, is the 40-page booklet that includes interviews with uh, Cargill, uh, Letter, uh, Sylvia Rappin-Rethair, illustrated with rare photos, and Werner Kinsey original Courier articles. There's also the collectible Blu-ray slip uh, slipcase and the sleeve. So it's it's kind of important, I think, when you watch before you watch this film, do your research a little bit, read a little bit about Werner, so that you can kind of separate the differences between the two films, because it's not actually a straight take on the killer and what he did, but there are sev- several elements that are very closely pulled from this that tie into what this deranged gentleman did. Overall, I would give this movie a four out of five stars. It's not an overtly bloody film. Don't go into it thinking that you're watching Hannibal or you know Silence of the Lambs or anything like that. I would put this more closely along the lines of a film more like Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, just without the dialogue. Again, a lot of innovation, I think, went into the process of how it was filmed, You know how in your face you see the killer and what he does from his perspective and what his victims see. The necrophilia scene, uh, some people might be squeamish about. It is not graphic. It is certainly not not as graphic as uh, anything that you would have seen in Necromantic or anything like that. It's a much more implied necro uh, um, necrophilia scene. Overall, I would give this disc uh, a ten out of ten. I don't know what else they could have put on this in terms of giving it to you. Again, I love. The slipcase and and cover, uh, the 40-page booklet is is just absolutely stunning. Like I said, everything you want to know about the film is included right here, including the interviews with the cast and crew, the director, just, just everything that you would want to know. I highly, highly recommend you head on over to Cult Epics and order your copy of this while it is still available. Again, this is one of those films that collectors have said over the years that's extremely hard to find. So like I said, 4 out of 5 stars for the film, 10 out of 10 for the disc overall with all the features and everything. This is a must-own for serious collectors out there. 
So make sure to head over to Cold Ethics and get your copy of this. In five minutes, Hank Braxton, Ron Carlson, and Ivana Korob of Unnatural will join us. But before that, we're going to go into our second digital dismemberment spot. Digital Dismemberment, blah, blah, blah. Metal Massacre, Spotlight for the Evening. Once again, the name of the band is Whitechapel. The CD is Our Endless War. The song is Psychopathy. Joined by one of our guests. Who have I got with me right now? 
This is Hank Braxton. How are you? Hey, Hank. Glad you could make it. Um, I'm just waiting for Rana Nirvana to join us, but, well, here comes one of them. Hello, guest. Hi, I've got hi, Ron. Hi. Who else have I got? I've got Ivana. Okay. Well, I, I was told that Hank made – I'm sorry? Hank, I'm sorry. Hank. Yeah, I've got Hank and Ivana with me right now. I was told that Ron uh, may have some other scheduling things, so he may be joining us a little bit late. He may be joining us nope, or leaving nope, us a little bit early. Any, any second now. Okay. Well, first of I all, just, uh, I want to say – I text and told him to call, so – Okay, okay. Well, first of all, I wanted to say congratulations to you guys for being a part of the After Dark Core Fest. Um, Hank, you know, first off for you, you know, what was it like to find out that your guys, you know, that your film had been picked up for the festival? It was pretty awesome. I mean, Ron actually told me that it might be happening, and and I didn't even know the festival was coming back. Um, It had been gone for a couple years, so it was like a double dose of cool news. Hello. And, and Ron has joined us now as well. Ron, when you found out that the film had been picked up by After Dark, what were your initial thoughts? Well, I was in the room when it happened, so, um, yeah, we were really excited. We, uh, we were, we were um, you know, we, we had a really good feeling. They've done some great stuff in the past, and then for us, this was like a, a, a really good release, you know, with the theatrical and the... Uh, and the VOD. Now, Ivana, for you, you know, how did you become involved with the project? Now, looking at your IMDb, and we all know IMDb can be incorrect, so if I'm wrong, please tell me. But this this appears to be your first horror project. So, how did you become well, involved, all, in, and what do you think of the process? First of all, thank you for the congratulation, and for me, it's and a huge honor because it's a, my first horror movie project, for sure. And um, to be honest with you, I wasn't sure what it was. And then when they explained to me and when I understood how big it was, I, I was like, okay, now I think now I can get nervous and all that. So um, I'm really, really excited, and I'm looking forward for everything that is uh, coming with that. I find the premise of the film to be interesting. This is, um, with all the other films that are part of After Dark this year, you're the one that, your your film pretty much is the one that, that deals with uh, an element in nature. Um, global climate change prompts a scientific corporation to genetically modify Alaskan polar bears with horrific and deadly results. First off, dumbass scientists should know better than to mess with Alaskan polar bears. But, you know, let me ask you guys, you know, when you when you first, you know, read the script, you guys knew that you were all working together, you know, how did you go about, for, for you as a director, Hank, how did you go about tackling the issue of knowing that you're going to be doing something with, you know, nature, polar bears? Well, right off the bat, uh, Ron and I, wanted to build a monster. So we wanted to get a, uh, you know, we wanted to go with an old school approach, you know, guy in a giant suit, robotic head, that kind of thing. Um, the kind of stuff we grew up watching and liking. So nature, alien, whatever it happened to be, we wanted it to be this big, massive monster with giant teeth, and, you know, drooling, blood spraying out of its mouth type of thing. That's always a good thing, you know, especially when nature runs amok. Now, Ron, for you, you know, you wore several hats on the film. Of course, you know, you wrote it, you produced it, you act in it. When you were writing the concept for this, you know, what what made what appealed to you about going with, uh, you know, science run amok and, and why polar bears? Well, you know, one, there were, Hank and I had talked about this. There, were, there wasn't really a film out there that we know of in the horror world that uh, – that has a polar bear as a, as a, as a, um, you know, main threat. And I had spent prior, you know, to writing this a bunch of time in Alaska on some fishing trips and being around, um, grizzly bears. And so there was, you know, I mean, they are just absolutely terrifying. 
And then Hank and I started talking about it, and we go, you know what? How about a how about a polar bear? And then we kind of, you know we we really just we went to Wikipedia, and the polar bear is the largest carnivorous animal um, on the North American continent. And um, we thought, man, that's awesome. And then and then we were like, you know, we don't really know of a horror film out there with a polar bear. And then so we decided this this was going to be our creature. And so then. You know, I kind of got down to it, and we mapped out, you know, kind of uh, about a hunting and fishing lodge I had kind of been to, and then we just mapped it out with, like, you know, let's put some people that are out of their elements in this lodge along with, you know, basically the, uh, you know, the locals that understand what's happening. And then also, in addition to that, polar bears, which have been in the news, are starving to death. That's a real thing. Um, so with climate change, you know, the uh, the polar bears are starving to death during these longer periods of the melt, so they're not making it through the summer. And, you know, you can even Google image, like, emaciated polar bears at the end of the summer that are super skinny because they need the ice and they they need the water to hunt. Now, well, Ivana, for you... That's one of the things that I love about the movie because it has that message that... Uh, tells the world this is what we are doing to our planet and it's not a typical horror movie where I mean it's not it's very atypical to actually have a message like that that is saying uh, yeah I'm going to scare you with this monster but uh, not just that we created a monster everything that we do daily is how we're destroying the planet and why uh, the other polar bears are actually suffering and everything that is happening in the world and I, I wanted to ask you, Ivana, with this being your first horror film and all, when you found out it was going to be, you know, a, a killer polar bear, you know, what was your initial thought on that? And and what was it like the first time you saw the creature while you were on set? Well, I didn't see it for the first time on set. Ron took me to the place where they were building it. So I saw a little bit of the the technical part, how they were uh, programming the, the hand to move and uh, the whole thing. So I was, first of all, I was amazed by how real it looked right there. And then after when I saw it on set, that was covered with uh, fake blood and all that. Then I was, like, I was like, okay, I'm really glad, Ron. Thank you so much for taking me there first because I'm not sure if I would like it this much because it's so believable. At one point, I walked into the room, the makeup room, and the tub was full of, like, organs, fake blood, um, skulls, and all that floating. And I looked at the makeup artist, Alex, and I said, did you do this? And he goes like, yeah. I'm like, you know what? I'm really glad that you're such an amazing artist, but I'm I'm hoping that I'm never, ever going to see this like just by accident because I would probably freak out. <laughs> now, that's an interesting aspect. You talked about, you know, the building of, of the bear and all that. Ron, for you, you know, as, as the guy that wrote it and, you know, you have a certain image in, in your mind as a writer when you're writing it, you know, what were your concerns as the writer about how you were going to bring it to the camera and make it look realistic? And the reason I ask is, you know, I've only seen the trailer. After Dark has been very tight on letting the trailer, you know, letting the film out because they want the surprises for the 16th release. But, you know, the short things that I saw in the trailer, I thought, you know, that's it's really amazing looking. It looks so practical. So, you know, when you guys went into the process of making the bear, how much did you correspond with the special effects guys to make sure that the vision in your mind was going to match what Hank was going to put on the screen? You know what? That's that's a good question. And and that was, you know, we worked with ADI on the, uh, uh, you know, on the building of the monster. And, um, you know, our, our real – our real thought to begin with was we really wanted something that looked like a polar bear. Um, when you watch the film, you can, you know, uh, basically they've crossed the polar bear's DNA with a, with another predator, a wolf, and so there was a little bit of a hybridness to the bear. Um, you know, it, it, and, and again, when you're, it, you know, we when we decided to build this, 
I don't know that we gave ADI an ample amount of time. We were kind of under the gun. So it, it, if, if, you know, if we had all the time in the world and all the money in the world, we would have, I think, um, you know, in, in my mind, it did look a little more like a traditional polar bear. They went a little more um, with a monster, I don't want to say a monster, but a little bit more of the hybrid of the bear. So it was different when I first saw the bear. I was, you know, there was a level of like, oh, it's not exactly what I wanted. Now, that said, I think the bear is super effective in this movie, you know. Um, it, but it's not, it's not exactly what I had in my head, if that makes sense. It does. You know, I got my so, start in the industry as an effects artist, and I and I know that sometimes you have to sit down with the writer and with the director to try and make sure that, you know, A, that your vision makes the screen, and B, that your vision is something that the effects artist can actually provide and do, if it's even technically feasible. You know, well, you know when I'm going to go back to, like, Jaws. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I think that's a perfect example, and... I think that's something that we ended up kind of doing in this movie where, well, I mean, there were two parts to that. One, we wanted to do that. We didn't, there's a lot of films, and especially with CGI right now, that, where they show the monster so much. And we think that that, I don't know, that's kind of been a detriment to the horror films because I think the anticipation of waiting to see that monster is part of the fun of a film, you know? And, and, um, so we were able to accomplish that by, you know, hiding our bear a little bit. But in the same way that we're using an animatronic bear, it's something that we can't actually, um, we can't show the whole bear because it's not an entire bear. You know what I mean? We have moving parts to the bear, but to be able to see a good clear shot of it, um, we do show the entire bear in the film. So don't be disappointed that, oh, we're only going to see parts of it. And when you do see it, it's great, but it's how you it's it, it's you know it's how Hank shot the film. It's um it's it's all it's angles and um you know the the way the the way the bear comes out. So I, I do think that our our bear looks way better than the jaw shark. <laughs> you know, mm. so I mean there's that. So I I think in the in the big in the big picture of things. And I think Spielberg was very disappointed with the shark, and that's why they hit it, you know. But at the end of the movie, uh, when you see the big shark at the end of Jaws, you're like, oh, you're kind of disappointed. You will not be disappointed in this. And you're like, oh, my God, that looks great. Now, Hank, for you, what kind of challenges did that present for you as a director, you know, working with an animatronic bear and looking at um – Looking at the IMDb, you had a bear, someone that was a bear performer, Jamie Hall. You know, what kind of direction did you give him to make sure that the shots that you wanted made it to the screen? Well, it's it's kind of it's kind of boring. It's very it's very technical. He's in this costume and can't see anything, and so a lot of times I'm just kind of out there yelling at him, you know, quarter left, quarter left, head up. And it's not just him. You've got you know a couple other guys controlling cables that control the the mouth and the facial expressions. And, and so what we would end up doing a lot of times is shooting a series, which is where we'd, we'd basically roll the camera and we would try to perfect the same move over and over again. And, and you know, 90, 95% of what you shot looks looks kind of goofy. But when you get the movement just right and you nail it, then you have something that, you know, sells the move. Well, like Ron had mentioned, you know, a lot of times – companies will go to CGI to do something like this. For you as the director, you know, when you're out there in the heat of the moment and and you're filming it, you know, how much more of a better reaction do you feel like you got from your actors because there was something physically there for them to act against as opposed to a green screen? That's definitely a huge plus. You know, they're there, they're in the elements. The lighting's all there. The monsters right there. They definitely have something to really play with, and that I think that really helps a lot. I I haven't I have yet to have anyone act against a tennis ball, but uh, I really like practical monsters and effects. It's really what got me into loving film and filmmaking in the first place when I was a kid. Was, you know, the, the special effects. How they do that? Exactly. 
Now, Ivana, for you, yeah, you know, you talked about they had taken you to, you know, to see it when it was being made and everything. You know, for you as an actress, um, I don't know if you've ever had to act against something that wasn't there, but how was it, you know, when it's coming at you, when you're in a sequence with that and it's physically there, you know, not acting against something that isn't there, how was that for you as an actress? I mean, how, how much did that pump you up, you know, seeing it come at you? It definitely it definitely helps a lot. And the shot that we actually shot in LA with a green screen where uh where I'm actually getting into the hole because we couldn't we couldn't shoot that in Alaska. Spoiler. Um, Spoiler. Oh my god, he's gonna kill me. <laughs> he's gonna oh my god. No, no. Ron, you have all the right to actually kill me because of that. Anyhow, yeah, it was a lot easier when it was there. Now, one of the things I found... found, You know, you you have to see the movie and find out. Definitely. But, I mean, it's in in trailer. You can see that part that is fooling somebody. Yeah, she's fine. She's fine. She's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It pulled my leg a little bit, but they put it back. One of the things that I've asked all the people that have that have worked on the After Dark film so far is, you know, about their locations. Like when I when I spoke to the guys that did um, Windwalkers, they talked about, you know, being out there in the swamps of Florida and having to watch out, you know, for the snakes and the alligators and things like that. And, um, you know, the Lumberjack movie, you know, they talked about the oppressive heat out there in Texas and things like that. Now you guys shot um, a portion of this in Alaska. Um, Ron, let's start with you. You know, what did you find to be the inherent challenges of shooting in Alaska, you know, weather-wise, animal-wise, things like that that you had to watch out for? Well, you know, producing a movie like this was was, was super different uh, in the sense of we shot 90, 98% of this movie in Alaska, and we also shot it in the month of January um, in Fairbanks and north of Fairbanks. Um, so we shot a movie further north, um, except for a documentary, a, a narrative, in the month of January, further north than anybody's made a movie. And it was, at times, negative 40 degrees. Um, mm. so, and on average, on average, I would say it was somewhere around zero to negative 10. And we had about a week and a half of, you know, negative 30 to 40 and um, really challenging. Um, you know, Ivana and the other actress uh, model was out there on the river in a bikini at about negative 35. So they could, li- they could literally only be exposed in that element in a bikini for about 90 seconds before fall. Oh, man. And anything else would set in. And, and, and I mean, that was a massive challenge to get – um, maybe about a minute and a half of the movie, you know, had to you had to do several several takes of that in order to like get it because we could have them out there for a short time and then we'd have to race them into a uh, a warming tent. So that was a big challenge. Um, now again, if you are dressed for it, if you have the the the, the clothing and everything uh, for the crew, they're out there 12, 14 hours a day in you know, negative 30 degree weather. And, um, and it was tough. It was really, really tough. And I would say the other, the other big challenge was, uh, our camera held up well. We shot on, uh, the red Epic. Um, but what didn't hold up so well were the lenses because when we would take them from that, you know, call it negative 30, negative 40, and then we'd have to go, because there was limited light up there as well. So we, when we're shooting in the winter time, it's only about five and a half hours of daylight um, a day up there. So our exteriors, we would shoot, you know, from about 10 a.m. to 2.30, and then we'd break for lunch, and then we'd shoot the rest of the day inside. And uh, mm-hmm. when we'd transfer those lenses from, you know, outside to inside, Um, they had to go through, you know, a little bit of a a warming process. You couldn't bring them directly in. 
And after about a week, we started the, the coating on the lenses started to uh, started to crack. So we ended up having to send those out, have another set of lenses um, brought in. We were shooting on vintage um, anamorphic lenses, and so they were kind of like a special lens. We ended up finding another set, having those sent to us, and then sending these back. But I think we ruined both sets, if I remember correctly. <laughs> so, so yeah. Uh, so shooting up there was a massive challenge. Again, now that said, everybody that worked on the movie, you know, I told them this is going to be the experience of your life. And, you know, and I, and I think I can speak for pretty much everybody that um, if we had the opportunity to make a sequel or to go back up there and to go shoot in those conditions again, Although it was difficult, every single person really loved it. It was really a special experience, and I think everybody would go do it. One night in the middle of the night, it was like maybe 2 o'clock in the morning, and we were shooting an all-night scene. And, uh, you know, it's negative 20. We're out there. And the aurora borealis, um, you know, the northern lights, just came over us like a rush of a green wave. And it just, the entire sky went green for, you know, three or four minutes, and then it rolled back out. And it was really cool. I mean, it was it was a epic experience that I think um, we all really will cherish forever. Now, Ivana, you know, he, you know, Ron just told us about, you know, you can only be exposed a certain amount of time before frostbite and things like that. Of course, that was a challenge. What else did you find personally to be challenging about shooting in that type of environment? Well, first, I remember when we, one of the callbacks, uh, Ron asked me, how do you do with cold? And I was super confident. I said, no, I'm okay. I'm not spoiled. Like, I can put up with it. It's fine. And he goes, like, do you even know how cold it is there? I'm like, yeah, 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 I know. I mean, I had a And by idea, the way, I have to I... jump in. <laughs> yeah, because every single girl that auditioned for this part, they were all like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, don't worry. I know how cold it is. I know, I know, I know. And every single one of them was exactly what Ivana was doing. But Ivana seemed a little extra You laughed in my so, face. Do you remember that? Do you go like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, I'm not spoiled. I'm coming from Serbia. And you're like, okay, kind of with that little smirk. And then one of the scenes as we were shooting in a bikini, it was below, I think, 35 that day. And uh, and then Ron goes, so Ivana, what do you think now? <laughs> and of course, my pride didn't allow me to say anything else besides, oh no, I'm totally cool. How are you? <laughs> so that was it. It was really, really fun because everybody was so nice, and every single person did their best to make the every shot uh, as quick as possible. So like Ron said, it was uh, the conditions were really extreme. So every time we would walk out of the tent, we still had the um, a lot of stuff uh, on, on top of us, on top of the bikinis. And I, I even had the warmers inside of the bikinis, like, you know, the, the hand warmers for when you go skiing and stuff. And mm -hmm. it was a little bit funny, but at that point, you don't care if it's uncomfortable or anything else. You just want to warm as much as possible, even if it's like a bikini, whatever it's bikini cover. And, uh, but then we had a people who were holding the, the heaters in front of us. So it was really, really like the organ, the, it was very well organized. And then that was, that was the challenging part. How, when it's so cold and you know that you have such a short time, how to make it as believable as, like, as possible, like the best possible. And that was the thing because you can't really um, give it a time to adapt and all that. No, you have to go run out, run out there and then just do it immediately. Uh, but like I said, because everybody was so amazing, it was, it was a lot easier for us. Now, Hank, this will lead to several questions to you, so I'll just ask small bits at a time here. First of all, let's just talk about, you know, Ron brought up, you know, the problems with, you know, the lenses from that technical end. Let's let's start there. For you, from a technical end, talking about your cameras, your mics, lighting, um, the animatronics for the bear, you know, 
did you allow yourself more time for shots not knowing what kind of effects the weather could have on your equipment? Hmm. I want to say yes, but at the same time, that we were working so hard and so fast all the time. I think that as things would break, we would just shift focus onto, like, well, let's knock this out real quick while we fix that. Um, but I will say that no equipment ever went down that was so detrimental that it just stopped us. I think, you know, we worked with the lenses as they were for a while, and, and the effect that it added was really just kind of like a something we had to color a little differently in post to, to clear it up, and that ended up working, so that was fine. Uh, the craziest equipment failure I think we had up there was uh, the diesel fuel in the generator actually froze. So oh, wow. We had to stop down for a little while while they, uh, they swapped out the diesel fuel so that we could get our lights going again. <laughs> I've been on some cold sets, but I've never had diesel fuel freeze on me, so I can only imagine how that went. I'll tell you, it was... You, it, you, and we and Ron and I tried to explain this to everybody before we went up, up there. It's just like you can't imagine how cold it is, and, and we couldn't either until we, you know, experienced it. It's like the first time you experience cold like that. It's just, it's absolutely nuts, and your your brain kind of switches over to like a survival mode as your primary thought. It's like keep warm, keep alive, and then like there's this little voice in the back of your head that's like, oh, you guys got to make this movie too when you're not freezing. Go. Now, the next question that kind of goes into that, we talked about, you know, like with Ivana being out there, she can only be in the in the bikini for a short period of time for shooting and things like that. As a director, you know, you kind of kind of keep things on pace. You know, you need a certain amount of shots. You need to get things done. You know, in the back of your mind, shooting in such extreme, such an extreme climate, you know, how much was the safety of your actors, actresses, and crew – in the back of your mind while you're shooting? Well, I, I'd, I'd like to say that most directors have that on the forefront of their mind. I, I think I think the safety and welfare of people on our crew and, and, and on our set is like, it's right there. That's what we're thinking about constantly, and especially with that cold. I was, I was really nervous about having them out there for too long and um, shot a lot of coverage where if we were just doing a close-up, they were wearing all their clothes except for their shoulders and their head up or they were wearing their pants, et cetera. So we knocked a lot of stuff out that way. And we also had, uh, you know, they'd wear their jackets, you know, like full full attire, and wardrobe would help them out with that. And, and they wouldn't even set foot on set until we'd already, like, blocked everything and the camera was rolling. So they would step out, we'd drop the clothes, and we'd shoot for a minute, and then they'd, we'd, they'd usher them back off to the tent. So, yeah, I was very, I was very worried about it the whole time. Uh, not to mention we're shooting on a frozen river, which despite the locals reassuring us that it's 40-foot-thick 40, 40 ice or whatever it was, it's, you know, it's a little, it could be a little nerve-wracking. I'm sure. Now, and, and the last in this series of questions is, you know, again, we talked about the cold, you know, the natural environment and things like that. You know, having such a limited time to do your exterior shots because of the daylight, you know, how did you guys take into account things like the Aurora Borealis? Did you ever have anything where wildlife became an issue? Did you run into any real bears or anything like that? No, most most life is shut down up there at that time of year. Um, we did we did see a moose on one of the last days of shooting, and uh, they're apparently nice. really dangerous, so they had to run that off. I'll tell you, that's that is that is definitely a massive animal. Maybe uh, maybe the next one will be about a moose. I would be down for that. I think we need we need something with zombie moose or something. I've I've been screaming that for years. Who has absolutely? Yeah, I, I grew up in upstate now. New. York. I grew up I grew in upstate New York as a kid. I saw a moose once, and I'll never forget it. You're right. People don't realize you can't look at a picture of a moose and understand how big a moose really is until you see one in person. Yeah, it's like a quiet. Maybe we can have some bikinis. Maybe we can have some bikinis made of moose fur. <laughs> I like her idea. Yeah, maybe this movie could be called, uh, you know, The Scary Moose Knuckle. <laughs> I know a lot of guys in Canada that would that would love to work on a film like that, but... <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> oh, boy, we're bad people. 
Um, let's switch gears for a second. We'll kind of stay on the technical easy. end. But, again, I, I kind of want to talk about your special effects people for a minute. You know, as an effects artist myself, there are always challenges when it comes to doing special effects. Things happen on set that you don't think about. I mean, I remember a zombie film I worked on, and it was like, zero degrees outside, you know, and compared to what you guys worked in, you know, that's nothing. That's a warm day. But, you know, like we had inherent problems with like we never anticipated that the blood would freeze in the tubes or that the tubes would contract and we couldn't push the blood through them. You know, you guys had uh, Timothy Leach and uh, David Penicus. Those are two of the guys listed. Uh, They were your mechanical technicians. You know, kind of talk about some of the challenges that you guys had with your special effects up there. I mean, it's it's got to be hard to, you know, you can say, oh, it's going to be minus 35, but how much prep work went into what those guys did, and were there ever any funny gags because the cold or the environment stifled something the first time you tried to do it? Well, we we kind of planned on the, uh, the blood tubes and everything freezing. We actually had a heaters from aquariums that would sit in our buckets of blood and uh, keep everything liquefied. Um, and then, you know, I can't say we had like a funny gag that really screwed up. We had a, you know, we had a few misfires and things that we had to kind of fix up and redo and, you know, adjust fire. But uh, the cold really didn't hurt our special effects too bad, in all honesty. Now, what led to you guys picking the effects people that you did? Because, like I said, from what I've seen of the trailer, their work looks fantastic. And, you know, I'm of the age, you know, I'm, I'm almost 40. So when when I was growing up, in horror films, the stars of the films were not so much the actors and the actresses as, as it was the effects men. You know, they were the guys that, that drew everything in, that, that made everything believable. What was it about these guys that made you say, these are the guys that can do it? Well, I mean, these guys have, you know, a body of work to begin with that, um, you know, they're one of the top guys in town. And I had been introduced to um, a guy named Alex, Alex, who runs the, uh, who's one of the partners at ADI, and so, you know, during that introduction, he and I discussed this, and they hadn't built a polar bear before. That was something that they had never done. So that was something that, like, was exciting to them because we didn't really come to them with a lot of money. Um, we came to them with, you know, an idea, and we came to them with um, a couple of dollars. And and they they liked the idea, and then they read the script, and they thought, you know what, this is something that, um, we'd like to be involved with, and so that's really kind of how that that team came into place. And um, and sure enough, I mean, if anybody, you know, I'll give you an example. When Hank and I, when I took Hank there the first time, um, Hank went through there and he saw um, a bunch of the different things that they had done, and he got a picture with one of them, and. And Hank literally said this because, it, 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 like, when you walk through there, it's, it's super impressive. And he's like, you know what? You guys could charge admission to a place like this. So, I mean, oh yeah, they really have. They've they've really um, done some great stuff. And uh, they had done a they had done a um, uh, you know they did the uh, what's the uh, the ape that's in um, uh, Zookeeper. Is it Zookeeper? I think it's Zookeeper. Yeah, um, yeah so they did the uh, the ape that was in that. And and when they were, you know, they were demonstrating, you know, with all the servos and the remote, remote control and everything that they'd done on that. And, you know, when we saw that, we were just like, this is awesome. Uh, if you can make our polar bear half as good as this, then we're in great shape, you know. And so that's really that's really how we ended up with those guys. Now, Hank, for you, you know, being the director and everything, you want your effects to come across a certain way. You know, how much dialogue did you have with them? And, you know, again, for me, you know, a lot of the directors, I've never done anything as complicated as a polar bear, but, you know, 
blood and gore is, is is definitely my specialty. You know, how much was it was it what was in your mind, and how much you know did you give them any any leeway sometimes when it came to how an effect would look or how it would come across on camera? Well, yeah, I mean you have to you have to give leeway when you're working with with practical and things like that because. Because one of the great things about filmmaking is it's such a collaborative art form, and you get happy accidents, and you get things that they don't quite work exactly how you had them penciled in or were written in a script, and that's like that's all part of it. Uh, unless you just have tons and tons of time and tons of money, uh, it's really hard to get it exactly how you want it. So, knowing the timeline that we had and the uh, situation we were dealing with and everything, you, you always give the artists, you know, some flexibility and some leeway. Um, that said, you know, we were pretty particular about a lot of things that were uh, important to us, such as, you know, height and reach of the bear and uh, the difference between the, the under fur color and the and the shoulder fur color, because we really wanted it to uh, to look like it had some depth to it instead of, you know, being just like a solid white mass that would just disappear into the snow. Now, Ivana, for you, again, with it being your first horror film and all, what were your, without giving anything away, because I don't want you to get in trouble, um, you know, <laughs> what were your Thank thoughts? You. <laughs> what were your thoughts on the special effects and and all of the blood and gore? And and I'm assuming at some point in the film, you know, you get bloody or something happens to you know. What was it like in that cold of an environment, having that stuff done to you? Well, it's definitely, for me, one of the best experiences I had in my life. And I'll just say that for one of the scenes, they were doing my makeup for six hours. Oh, and wow. And the makeup looked so good that I think I took, like, ten videos of just making fun of, like, making some weird noises and just being myself, like, uh, doing some stupid stuff because I just couldn't believe how good it looked on me. So literally, I don't know that they were laughing around because they were like, "Okay, can you stop now? Can we finish the makeup?" I'm like, "No, no, no. I will. I don't know if I will ever have something like this on me. So can I please just play a little bit longer?" They're so like, "Yeah, okay, go on." Well, no, you know, it's and, really, and then, really and, good. And that's good to hear. Um, you know, I had I've had actresses complain, you know, in the cold, you know. Oh, the blood doesn't feel good. You know, it's this, it's that. It, it's nice to hear that you were very open to the experience and, and that you had a good time with it. And you know, that leads into you talk about a six hours for the one makeup. You know, one of the things I try to you impress learn upon, a lot. You do, you and, learn that's, and that's a lot. what I was. And there's a lot of things that I don't know how to do. And for me, like I, I can either play a spoiled princess and complain about everything, and oh my god, or whatever. But the thing is that I really want to learn, and I want to, and you, on your own, you can pick the way how you can deal with life, either with a positive or negative uh, way of seeing things. And for me, it's definitely positive, because that's something that I've never seen in my life, and I never felt on my skin, and uh, if I have to touch it, and even I once, I touched it, and they were like, okay, you know you messed it up right now, we have to do it again. I'm like, I'm sorry, but it's just it's so icky, like I have to touch it. So I, I was very interest, interested in how it works and everything that they were putting on me. So for me, it was one extra experience. Now, like I said, with this being your first horror film and all, and and seeing the effects work, and experiencing how all of that is done, has that changed the way that you viewed horror films before you had ever worked on one? Hundred percent, hundred percent. And even it, my it, friends who went to see it, they were like, "Ivana, you know that we are looking at horror movie just because we love you." And I'm like, "I know, thank you, but I'll explain to you how they did that." You know, it's going to be fine. You're not going to, you could be okay after that. It's only a movie, so you can go home safe. Uh, yeah. yeah, and I was going to say, you know, how, how how does that change your view? Uh, you know, I have, a sis, I have a sister, and when we were growing up, I used to terrorize that poor child with horror films. And she <laughs> developed a very serious phobia of them for years. 
And then when she worked on, she was an extra in the first film that I did, and I did a bunch of makeup and effects on her. And now horror films are her preferred films to watch. Now she loves it. For you as an actress, having done other types of roles, dramatic and things like that, how, how much really does the experience of seeing how it's done change your perspective of these types of films? Well, I'm, I'm coming from one very crazy, funny, but positive crazy family where we did all kind of scaring each other. My, my dad would put a mask to scare my mom, and we would do, like, all the fun, fun stuff. And for me, I love extreme things. And although the, it wasn't like when I would watch a horror movie, I would get scared. And now when I when I know how they make it and all that, now I think I look at those special effects and I try to figure out, oh, maybe they did it this way or that way, or maybe they, they used something that we used. So I think I'm looking at it more professionally right now, and I'm enjoying it more. So I'm not just... Uh, looking at the story and then getting scared because of something happened in a movie. Now I'm looking in more professionally, looking how they did it and how we did certain things. Now, Ron, for you, you know, you're not a stranger to the horror genre as well. Um, you know, you had you had done something for the Tales from the Crypt TV episode back in 1994. You know, you worked on Lifeblood and things like that. You know. What are your thoughts on what the horror genre was and what it has become, and what do you feel unnatural adds to the genre that hasn't been there before? Well, I mean, I don't know that, you know, the one thing that we add maybe as a polar bear, as a creature that, that maybe hasn't been really introduced as, as, as a horror villain. And, you know, I, I, I don't know that the... Uh, the genre has changed. I mean, our movie, when you see it, we shot with vintage lenses and we kind of did a throwback to stuff that really hasn't been done now in a while. You know, I mean, that's really, that was kind of our approach was we wanted to bring back, like I said, show less of the monster and build it up for the reveal. So that was something, um, you know, something that, that we did. Uh, I think that, um, you know, and 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 another thing that that, that certainly now, um, and you know, Hank and I are working on another project right now, and and something that uh, that made the Alaskan wilderness great for this is it's very very difficult now to isolate your main characters. Um, there are places in Austra- or, or, or in Alaska where you cannot get cell service. You know, you actually it really is the last frontier. I mean, it's. There's only 700,000 people that live in the entire state, and there's many, many places that you can't get to except by airplane. So, I mean, it happens to be a place that you really can't isolate them. But with cell phones, and, and I mean, that's, that's always the challenge to writing a new script now is, man, how do we isolate these guys? Um, and even, like, in this current script that we're doing, you know, it's like the – cell phones now even if they're even if they're locked and somebody else can't use the code of a cell phone that's still working there's still an emergency uh where you can call 911 from the phone you know at least on the new software on the iPhone 6 um yeah. so it's like uh it just keeps making it more and more difficult so i think that's going to be one of the big challenges moving forward with 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 horror you know um so that's really uh yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I don't want to say that I've, I've done a ton of horror because I haven't. I, you know, I directed Lifeblood, which was a lesbian vampire movie, and then I was in Tales of the Crypt, um, you know, an episode a long time ago. So, um, yeah, I think I think the, the, you know, it always gets harder and harder and harder to 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 keep it fresh and to create something that hasn't been you know, already done. And that's, that's, that's really something that, um, you know, we're striving to do. Now, Hank, for you, of course, you know, you're not, and, you're and not I'm a stranger gonna, and to, I hate to uh, Go ahead. To, I'm going to have to actually get off the call, Michael, if that's okay. I've just, I've, I've got a meeting for our new movie at, uh, Oh, that's at quite all right. I, thank you. Thank you for coming on. And, and I'll certainly carry on with, 
with our other two guests. But thank you so much for being on, and know that you're always welcome on the podcast. If you ever have any more horror news that you need put up, just contact me and let me know, and we'll get it up on Horror Society. Oh, that's great. Really appreciate it, and thanks for having me. Not a problem. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, Hank, for you, you know, you're, well, you're not now, a stranger now that to... We got rid of, now that we got rid of Ron, we can, we can talk about him. No. <laughs> yeah, we can get serious now, right? <laughs> no, you know, he's not going to kill me if I say something wrong, so yay! <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're not a stranger to to the genre either, you know, Evil Deeds 2, Blood Effects, Chemical Peel, you know, very similar to to what I asked Ron, you know, you know, what do you feel like the film adds to the genre that, that wasn't there before, and, and, you know, what do you think about how horror films are being made these days? Well, I will say, uh, I mean, other than the, the polar bear and, and the Alaskan climate, I, I I don't know that it does add a lot to the horror genre, and I think that that was, you know, intentional. We really, we really tried to do like a throwback to old school horror, and that's why we did, you know, Practical Creature, and we shot on old school lenses. Like, I really wanted to approach it like we didn't have computers and that kind of thing. So, mm-hmm. that's what it adds or brings back, if you will. So, if you enjoy that kind of film, you know, I think you'll really like this. Um, as far as horror goes, I mean it's always evolving and it's it's always it's always kind of political and like has its you know, finger on the pulse of America in a way. And people routinely try to, you know, reinvent it or, or up the ante and, and I think you end up with a few different recurring themes there. You either have somebody come up with something completely new and original that's amazing or some kind of clever twist on an old idea, or we made it more brutal than anything you've ever seen. Right. Now, one of the things I had wanted to ask, and I wish I had asked it while Ron was here, because I would have loved to have gotten his thoughts on this as a producer, but, you know, as a, as a director and Ivana, you as an actress, I, you know, I want to get your thoughts on this. You know, where specific, you know, where did you guys shoot? Did you just... You know, was it outside of a city? Was it, you know, Inuit land? I mean, kind of talk about the location where the primary shooting occurred. It's it's really both. There are a lot of uh, natives in the area. Um, it was just it was just outside of Fairbanks, Alaska, which is a it's a really small town. Uh, mm-hmm. And so you drive five ten minutes outside the town limits, and you're just like in wilderness. Like you might, it looks like you're in the middle of nowhere. Right. The reason that I asked was is um I had reported on a story yesterday on Horror Society. And um so would you say that you were shooting on on native land at that point? Um very likely at least at least partially. Um we actually had a couple of uh native people working on our film and uh they were really cool. There was uh this one guy his name was Tarzan. That's what he went by. Uh, his, his real name was James, but he went by Tarzan, and he was a he was like the king of the snowmobiles. Like he would just zip around on the rivers on that thing at like 90 miles an hour, no no questions asked. Um, yeah, and, and he, he was making sure that we feel safe about everything because we were very curious about the frostbites and all that. So he right. was very very helpful with. Uh, with all the the info that he was kind of feeding us with, no, don't worry, do this. If this happens, like you should do that. Like he was very helpful. Yeah, he was he was super chill. Just like this was just everyday life to him, and he's from like way up north. Uh, his family actually like hunts whales with spears, and so oh wow, he's like he's like legit. Um, I think he was Eskimo actually. The reason yeah, that I, I ask think you is, told me he was an Eskimo. The reason he that I ask is, like I said, Eskimo. I reported a story yesterday on Horror Society, and I don't know if you guys had heard about it, but it's the reason why I asked you if you shot on native land was, did you guys hear about um, that movie Maze Runner, The Scorch Trials? Um, Dylan O'Brien, who was the star in that film, had gone on um, – Live with uh, the, that you know, Michael Strahan and whatever the, the the lady's name is, 
And he admitted on camera that while they were filming that film, they were on native land. And he talks about how they took artifacts and stuff from an ancient Indian burial ground while they were shooting out there. Well, and I was wondering, bad. you know, when I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not asking you to, you know, to throw the guy under the bus or anything. But what what I was wondering was, is you know, you were out there in Alaska shooting on on native land. You know, were you guys ever told, you know, don't mess with this, don't mess with that, you know, things like that? And and like I said, I'm not asking you to throw throw this guy under the bus, you know. But you know, what are your thoughts on actors and actresses and crew members who? don't respect the customs of the people of the land that they're shooting on. Well, I, we don't draw limits to just, you know, native lands or anything. Our, the golden rule is you leave the film set and film location the way you found it or better because you're mm-hmm. just, that's just the golden rule in life. You know, that's just respecting everybody. But also, every time some filmmaker does something that casts a bad light on filmmakers, you're hurting everybody else in the industry. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I thought it was it was it was pretty sad, uh, you know. And then to go on the national TV and, it, and admit that you did something like that. So I'm I'm glad to hear that you know you guys were respectful of of where you were and the customs and everything that was going on. Absolutely. Without yeah, doubt. very much. So, you know, you guys finished it. You did pre-production and everything. At this point, have other than what's coming up on the 16th, where the premiere is going to happen. Have you guys had an opportunity to screen the film for friends and family? Has it played anywhere else up until this point? We did do a friends and family cast crew screening back in February, but that's the only place it's played. We've uh, we've kept it under wraps. Certainly. Well, of course, as the director, I, I know that you've you know you've seen the final cut, Ivana. I'm, I'm assuming that you've seen it too. You know, and I'm not asking you to give away plot points or anything. I know it's hard, you know, when you work on a film and, and you're on set every day and, it, you know, by the time you're you're done with it, it's almost to the point, ah, oh, I don't want to see it, you know. But when you guys finally <laughs> got to see the final product, you know, were you blown away with what you guys managed to capture? Was it everything that you were hoping it was going to be? Or did it even surpass your expectations? Well, I'm going to tell you that I haven't seen even the final cut. So ah. I I've been to a screening, and that's the only the only time when I actually saw uh, at least a, I mean uh, what uh, the the um, not finished version. And even when I did the ADR, they didn't want to play me the scenes, and they said, "Okay, be patient. You're gonna see it." I'm like, "Come on, just like a couple of scenes." And Ron was like, "Nope, nope, nope, nope." <laughs> And that's why I'm always joking. Ron is gonna kill me because he's more strict with me. And uh, so I was, I was begging him to play me at least like two scenes, and he didn't want to let me see it. So I'm super excited to to see the final cut. How about for you, Hank? Well, to be honest, I don't think I'll be able to enjoy it for about five or seven years. Um, that's just how it is when you when you're an artist uh, or filmmaker. It's it's so hard to look past the things that you wish you could have done better or or that didn't work. But there's quite a few things that I'm like, oh, well, that, that worked out remarkably well. That's that's great. You know, there are nice surprises, but it's just, it's you're just such a perfectionist, you know. It's never good enough. I, I firmly yeah, I agree. get that. As, a, as an effects artist, I can, I can sit down to every one of my movies and go, damn it, I wish I had done this, or damn it, I wish I had done I, I know exactly how you feel about that. Of course. Well, I, you know, and I think that's something thing, all artists share. Yeah, and one thing about my, uh, one of the scenes when I was in a bikini, normally when I'm in a bikini, I don't eat that day because I want to make sure that I look my best. And they, right. they told me on set, you know, if you don't eat here, your blood is going to freeze. So you cannot do that. And I was like, okay, to stay alive or to look skinnier on camera, I think I'll pick stay alive so I ate bacon that morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, bacon will save you every day. Bacon's good. <laughs> now, now speaking speaking of that, um, last week's show, um, they had filmed over in Italy, and they had talked about how they made friends with 
uh, some of the cast and or some of the local film or local film, some of the local townspeople having dinner with them, the great Italian food and things like that. When you guys were on set, you know, did you did you did you make friends with a lot of the local townsfolk? And what was you know, did you get to experience any of the local food cuisine while you were there? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I have a lot of nice things to say about Fairbanks, but the uh, local cuisine will not be included in that section of positive thoughts. Um, I, I'm sorry, Fairbanks, but the food up there is so bland that when we were near wrapping production, we actually went to Taco Bell, and it was like the most amazing experience. <laughs> a, that's, how, that's how bland it was, and I'm sorry to say that, but... You know, maybe I'm was it, spoiled by Los Angeles. Was it, I mean, well, well, I mean was it just... had good donuts. Well, there hotel you go. Hotel had At good donuts. It, that was one night, yeah. <laughs> was, it just, was it just strange, exotic food that you hadn't eaten before? I mean... No, no, not, I mean, trust me, I've eaten a lot of weird stuff in my day, but uh, it wasn't anything like that. It was just, it was Americana, um, pretty much everything, except for when we had, you know, some... Some of the native stuff that was cool. That was interesting. I'm just talking about the food in general. You know, you want a hamburger, oh, okay. you want a salad, those types of things. It was like prison food. <laughs> You're killing me. I'm so sorry. The 16th, the 16th is the big day. You know, it'll come out in, in select theaters around the country. First of all, are you guys? going to be in a central location if fans want to come out and meet you guys you know where are you guys going to be when the film premieres well most of us will be in los angeles um but we do we are sending some people to some of the other screenings and hopefully the website will reflect that and because uh, you know nobody's from la like we're all we're all from all over the place i'm from colorado uh, I'm going to try to make it out to one of the Denver screenings, uh, and I think some other crew members are going to follow suit, because we're in 11 cities. Ivana, how about you? Where are you going to be for the screening? Well, I'm going to be in L.A., and uh, I'm actually from uh, I'm from Serbia, and I hope that uh, when we actually aired the, the movie there, I'm going to be there as well. But I'll try I'll try my best because I have some other projects uh, going on. So I'll do my best to be in as many locations as possible. But for now, like I said, L.A. is for sure for now, and the rest I think I'm going to um, have to, to discuss that with, with Ron and Hank, and uh, then we'll see. Well, you know, it has to be asked, because I've asked every other filmmaker so far that's been part of the After Dark series for this run, you know, is there a possibility of a sequel? Oh yeah, I've uh Ron and I have already been working on the details. Um it's about a uh you know, they load up some more of these mutant bears, you know, like a dozen of them this time, uh onto a train which actually uh derails in South Central and we're going to call it uh Bears in the Hood. Oh. And a movie shit. King. I want in I want in on this. I don't care if I'm an extra. You can maul me on 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 film, I don't care. We got we got we had sharknadoes. We've had snakes on a plane, and now we've got bears on a train. Oh hell yes! <laughs> I, I mean, I want in, man. Doing, like, I want in. Yeah, Kill I mean, me. we'd love to do some goofy, fun stuff, but uh, seriously, I mean, if if we do get to a sequel, and you know, the film's got to make money, so you know, fans, anybody who likes it, you know, you have to buy a ticket. Please don't pirate or download it. Um, exactly. Get the VOD you know, does, when it comes we're out. We're so lucky. Yeah, if we're so lucky that we get to do a sequel, um, we do have several uh, pretty cool ideas that you know we'll make it bigger and better, and more bears, etc. And you know, one last serious question before the end of the interview. You know, it's going to be in theaters. Of course, DVD, hopefully Blu-ray, things like that. But the big thing nowadays, of course, is video on demand. As a filmmaker, you know, for you, Hank, and Ivana, for you as an actress, you know, what do you guys feel about VOD and the exposure that it gives films these days that films in the past, you know, may have done commercially better had they been available through that format? 
Ivana, would you like to start? Please do. <laughs> I want to hear your opinion on this one because I'm for it. I was brought up differently, and now I've been in U.S. for eight years, okay. and I changed my She's culture about that. She's dodging it. Okay. Uh, let me. Well, <laughs> it's a complicated answer, to be honest with you. Um, it's first of all, I will say I love VOD. Uh, my wife and I rent movies VOD all the time. It's great. You can just watch something on your couch. It's like, bam, it's there in a couple seconds. It's amazing. It's technology. But at the same time, I would say it's it's simultaneously the best time and the worst time to be an independent filmmaker because you have all this technology has made making quality films. It's made it so much easier, and, and, and the entry barrier is so much lower cost-wise. And, and, and so now you have just tons and tons of people making films. And... The, the the indie film world has kind of turned into like a YouTube almost, where just tons of people are uploading content, and you got to stand out in the crowd. And fortunately, VOD gives people options to see tons and tons and tons of stuff. But if you were to make a movie, you know, back in the '80s, you know, you could sell it for like a million bucks, no problem, because they wanted stuff with VHS so bad. Right. Ivana, well, you said you I kind of changed your culture like- on it. Yeah, because, um, like I said, for me, and uh, I'm from Eastern Europe, and it was different. We would go to movies, and the technology wasn't as advanced as it is now, and, of course, everything gets there a little bit later. So, for me, VOD was one of the best things ever, because I was like, oh, my God, I have everything available. And But then, at the same time, I still love movie theaters like for me to go to a movie theater is a different experience and i am somebody who loves at a stuff that are maybe not funny for other people because my imagination is very creative and i remember right. something that happened in the past or something that reminds me of somebody or something else and i laugh very loud and i'm not and i'm not embarrassed of it because i think why not it's just my experience and uh, maybe I'm annoyed to some other people. I don't know, but nobody complains till now. Nobody hit me in a the theater yet. And um, so VOD for me definitely is when you have the lazy days and all those, like that you don't feel like getting out of the house. And it's great, but, again, I would still pick to go to a theater to watch the movie. Yeah, I'm right there with both of you. It's great to experience with a crowd. Well, guys, I'll, I love you know, I'll uh, wish you... I love when everyone jumps or whatever, you know, together. It's just, uh, it's if you can do it in the theater, it's definitely better. It's a, it's a, it's a more fun experience. It really just enhances everything. And there's no exactly. argument there. Exactly. Well, guys, I want to wish you all the success in the world with with this release. Before I let you go, you know, tell people where they can follow you: Facebook, Twitter. If they, you know. Anything, uh, future projects, you know, what do you want to tell your fans? Ivana, let's start with you. Well, first, thank you. Uh, I hope that you're going to come to see the movie, and then we're going to, uh, we can meet in person, and you can be there and actually tell us what you think about the special effects and everything else. And because you if have, I can make it out, you have If I can make it out to L.A. In, on October 16th, I will do my best. I can't make any promises, though. That will be nice. Uh, I am on Instagram and Twitter everywhere as Ivana Karab, just I-V-A-N-A-K-O-R-A-B. And I'm actually going to, I'm starting my YouTube channel now where I'm going to put some of the, the behind-the-scenes shot from um, from when we shot the, the movie and now from the, the from the premiere as well and some everyday stuff that um, I'm pretty goofy and, and, and a little bit weird. So those things I think I'm going to start before the movie is out, so then the, the fans would be able to see a different side of me. Well, let me know about that, because I would definitely love to share the uh, the makeup effect stuff on Horror <laughs> Society. We're friends on Facebook, oh, yeah, so definitely sh- shoot me info on that. Thank you. I, I most definitely will. And those are very funny ones. Hank, how about you? Uh, you know, I just think everyone should leave me alone. Uh, I don't really <laughs> like people. Uh, <laughs> He's the nicest person on the planet. Why are you lying I'll, I'll, right now? <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll be, I'll be honest. Uh, uh, most of my 
most of my stuff I put out on Twitter. Um, I mean, my handle's at it's Braxton Film, but uh, no one's going to spell my name right anyway, so just look for Hank Braxton and you'll find me. Yeah, and I felt like a um, real ass. You don't know how many times I've had to correct my spell check when spelling your oh, last okay. name. <clears throat> I've had to, I have to program every single computer or device I did. No, spell my name this way. You know, I thought maybe I should just give up and just change the spell. <laughs> did you try spelling yeah, my time name I you... and see what it comes out? Your name, you but, know, it never spell checked me on your name, Ivana. Every time I spelled Hank's last name, the damn computer would change it. I wouldn't catch it, and then when I went and posted it somewhere, I'd see his name was spelled wrong, and I'd be cussing the computer out, having to go back in and change posts because it did not want to spell his last name the way that he spells it. It was the weirdest thing. Well, I don't know if it's my weird. name. My spell family spelled it wrong. To- my, for some uh, reason, my name spells checks to Obama, and whoever writes Ivana and goes to I, re, I receive a text Obama, I'm laughing, because it does to me as well. Not anymore, because I think the spell check adjusts, uh, but it is the funniest thing on the planet. I'm like, how do you actually get Obama out of Ivana? I don't know, but that's what it is. Thanks, Obama. Well, guys, again... Thank you so much for being on. I wish you all the success. If, you know, you're always welcome on this podcast. If you have any more genre news about any projects that you're working on, we're all connected on Facebook, on Twitter. Shoot me a line, and I'll get it up on Horror Society. Thank you so much for having us. I have a a few monster films in the works, so uh, we'll we'll be chatting soon, I'm sure. Oh, I, I, anytime, man. You know, just hit me up, and I will gladly report any news that you got. Wonderful. Well, Thank we'll you be talking so much. in about a week. <laughs> All right, Thank sounds good, man. I'll talk to you guys soon. All right, take it easy. See you okay. on Instagram. <laughs> All right. And once Have again, ladies and night. gentlemen, you too. And once again, everyone, thank you to Hank Braxton, Ron Carlson, and Ivana Korob of the upcoming film Unnatural, part of the After Dark Horror Fest 8 Films to Die For, coming out on October 16th in select cities around the United States and on video on demand. Coming up in a few minutes, we're going to do our second digital dismemberment spotlight for the evening where we cover Scream Factory's Blu-ray release of Tales from the Crypt Presents Bordello of Blood, the Collector's Edition. And we will have a special guest joining us. Creep Show Radio host Chris McGibbon will be talking about the film with me. You should know that name, of course, from Creep Show Radio exclusively on Horse Society Radio. And we'll ask him when he's going to get his ass back on the airwaves because we miss him. But before that, we're going to go into our final Metal Massacre spotlight for the evening. Once again, the name of the band is Whitechapel. The CD is Our Endless War. The song is Let Me Burn. The mouth of hell is open for you
It seems owner, owner Madam Lilith, played by Angie Everhart, and her luscious cohorts want more than money. They want blood. Soon, Rafe finds himself up to his neck in a den of hungry vampires and battling the Reverend Jimmy Current, played by Chris Sarandon, a slick televangelist with an unstoppable talisman. <clears throat> Directed by film producer Gilbert Adler, co-starring Erica Elenick, Corey Feldman, Aubrey Morris, and Phil Fondarcaro, I hope I pronounced that right, and Fonda Women Carl. with Blood. What's that? Fondarcaro is how you pronounce it. Okay, well, we got it right then. Yeah, you got and it. And brimming with blood, lust, and wicked laughs, this is one brothel you'll visit again and again. <clears throat> so, uh, what were your thoughts on Bordello of uh, Blood there, man? Um, well, it's not my favorite movie. Um, it's, uh, you know, a little bit of background on this one. I uh, I didn't get to see Bordello of Blood in theaters. Uh, I did see Demon Knight in theaters, which was the first horror film I ever saw in a theater. I was the ripe old age of seven when that movie came out. My aunt took me and my older brother to go see it and, uh, you know, quickly realized it probably wasn't the best of ideas. And I imagine when the next Tales from the Crypt movie came around being called Bordello of Blood, the idea of taking two uh, still young kids to go see that one probably didn't, you know, ring too close in her mind. So it was a matter of basically waiting till it came out on video and uh, I remember seeing the trailer for it on the Frighteners VHS tape and um, being super stoked about it being out and being finally being able to check it out and, um, and then I, I did and I actually when I was a kid I really liked Bordello of Blood quite a bit I actually thought it was a, um, it was a really funny movie that you know I, I enjoyed watching I loved the intro with the Crypt Keeper and uh, you know um, I, I, li- I like the Holy Water you know, fights, and I thought Dennis Miller was funny. I love the Whoopi Goldberg cameo. Um, but as my as I've aged, you know, as people do, uh, my tastes have become a little more defined, and uh, Bor- Demon Knight has held up very well for me. I still love Demon Knight quite a bit. I didn't call in for that one last week, so uh, this one, on the other hand, just gets worse with every subsequent viewing. Um, I find more and more about it I don't like. And it, it, I, I'm not going to go out and say it's like the, it's the worst movie ever made. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's complete garbage. But it's mostly garbage, I think. I'm not a huge fan of this one. So. Well, you know, and I, and you know, thanks for making me feel old. Since you were, what, seven when Demon Knight came out, I was 19. So thanks a lot for that. But, oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, B- Bordello of Blood. You know, I, I saw both of these in theaters, and, you know, Bordello of Blood, you know, that was when I had first really started finding out who Dennis Miller was, his humor, and things like that. I had always been a big fan of Tales from the Crypt. And I think, and as we will talk about when we get to the special features here in a moment, you know, I think what was wrong with the film was Dennis Miller. Yeah. You know, he 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 just didn't... There were parts where his dialogue to me came across as brilliantly funny, and then there were other times in the movie where you feel like he just didn't give two shits about doing anything in this film. Yeah. Yeah, well, evidently he, he did not. So, um, it, you know, it, it's funny because I, I guess now for me, the most enjoyable part of the movie for me Pretty consistently, I will say, has been Angie Everhart, which is weird for a gay guy to say the best part about the movie is the supermodel, Um, you know, that really couldn't act very well. She she wasn't a great actress, let's be real, but she was gorgeous, you know, beautiful woman to look at. And she did have some kind of, like, some edge that she sort of added to the role, this sort of charming, you know, kind of... Out, you know, look and everything about her. You know, she definitely pulled off the whole vampire, like being seductive and all that stuff. I mean, I, I don't feel like she she lost anything in translation there. Um, you know, and and I did like Chris you know, Sarandon in the film. Chris Sarandon's always good. I mean, you, I really can't give him any shit either. But even even in this one, though, like he 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 brought like some. I don't know, like doing. I guess the southern accent thing works, but I mean, it's just I don't know. I felt like he was even sort of hamming it up a bit, and I mean, uh, well, he was playing an evangelical preacher. I mean, he was. No, he was. He was. But even when like he's being himself, so to speak, like it just felt like, 
you know what I mean? That it, like those people, you feel like once the cameras go off, they're like kind of a different person. They don't. That's that's an act, you know, for a lot of those people. It, 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 it that whole thing is a stage. It's it's a show. But when the cameras are off and the people go home, you don't you don't see them going home and going, "Hey, honey, how was your day?" You know, they don't. You know, but that's what Chris Sarandon did when he was just being the character. He wasn't like he was still that guy on stage. So you're kind of like. Huh? Like, like, I think he's, you know, he's, he, he's, he's, he's rolling with us a little too, too much. But, uh, um, you, you know, I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's a very strange movie because it, it definitely doesn't play as a horror film. It's, it's not scary at all. Um, it, it's, it's a comedy. I mean, at, at best, and it's not a very good comedy because even the jokes aren't that funny. Some of Dennis Miller's stuff is funny. But for the most part, it's a very flat comedy. You know, it doesn't have a lot of – it's not over the top enough to be really funny, and it's not funny enough to be – funny enough to watch more than once. You know, like maybe a once-off would be great, you know. And But Demon Knight had that great balance of car comedy and also camp, too. There was a camp value to Demon Knight. Like that had a really – it also had a really great cast, which I'm – obviously helped out that film quite a bit and i think it even had a better script you know because vampires are kind of tired even back then it's like well what can you really do with them you know it's all the same stuff so you know with demon knight you could kind of you know you got a little creative and but it just felt like everybody brought their a game to that movie you know what i mean everybody was there to to do the best job they could and do the best they could with what they were given and so on and so forth whereas bordello of blood i think i felt like a lot of people were just like oh, wow, we're doing this shitty vampire movie. You know what I mean? Like, no one really felt like that they were excited right. to be a part of it. Well, I, so. I, I would agree with you on that. I mean, my rating for the film would be two out of five stars. You know, it's probably one of the lowest ratings I've given anything on the show. And it's, like I said, you know, it kind of comes across in in the acting. Now, where I think this disc shines is in the behind-the-scenes special feature, Tainted Blood, the making of Bordello of Blood. And I think you would agree with me on that. Um, you know, the one guy that you thought would have been a pain in the ass on the set and would have been a dick the whole time would have been Corey Feldman, but it turns out he was the guy that was trying to get everyone to have a good time while making the film. Yeah, yeah, he was the uh, he was the good guy. The funny, you know, I, I I've had my my rants about Corey Feldman, you know, being a uh, a drama queen and being wanting to be the center of attention and being overly dramatic with everything he does because let's be real, he is. But I, I've never heard of him, like, just being an asshole. Everybody I've ever talked to or read interviews with or anything like that, for the most part, have said he was actually a really decent guy to work with. Um, you know, just very kind of out there, energetic. And that can be off-putting to some people, especially for people who aren't necessarily actors. Like, Angie Everhart wasn't an actress. She was a supermodel. Dennis Miller wasn't an actor. He was a stand-up comedian. Even the girl, um, Erica, uh, L, 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 I can't pronounce her last name. Ellen Eak. That's the one. Um, she was like the only other actress on the film that was part of the core cast. You know, Whitney Chris Sarandon too, but he's not a main character, so to speak. Even him and Phil Fondacaro are kind of, you know, they're side characters. Um, her only acting experience really was kind of like Baywatch and a couple of like other types of movies. So it was like, Under you know, nobody was like was seasoned at that point. And even with, but even so with Demon Knight, you didn't really have that. There weren't a lot of people on Demon Knight that had done a lot of stuff at that point, but they were people who had talent that wanted to be actors. I mean, I think Dick Miller and William Sather were probably the, the only two people on that movie that had really done a lot at that point. Um, well, right. I mean, you know, you talk about Demon Knight. I mean, that really springboarded uh, Billy Zane's career. You know, after that, yeah. he really started getting a lot of the good roles. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, definitely. So just so people know, the other special features, including with the disc, or audio commentary with co-writer and producer A.L. Katz. Uh, of course, we talked about the Tainted Blood featurette. Um there's a still gallery, gallery, a theatrical trailer, and there's the little uh, video blur because, of course, this was back during VHS, and I loved in that. I don't know if you caught it, if you watched all those features where they talked about if you ordered the uh, three copies of the movie for your store, you got a free uh, popcorn maker, a thirty nine ninety nine deal. I, that just – I laughed my ass off when, when that little part came up on the disc. Um, <clears throat> you know, but as, as far as um, – because you're definitely 
have a much sharper eye for it real quick. What were your thoughts on the transfer and the sound quality for this? Well, to, to me, that all looked and sounded good. Like, I, I didn't have any issues with that stuff at all. Um, you know, with the Universal Catalog stuff, people really get into the technical aspects of how these transfers are put together because um, Universal tends to provide, um, well, uh, you know, to be frank, all of their transfers, you know, transfers that were done sometimes for TV. They weren't necessarily done for Blu-ray, so to speak. Um, and there can be a drop in quality, but the Ironic part is, as much as people or uh, people didn't like this movie or weren't really proud of it, Bordello of Blood actually has a pretty decent transfer. It's actually better than Demon Knights, which is kind of shocking in terms of picture quality. Audio quality, they're both pretty much on par. Uh, Demon Knight, had, I think, had a fantastic 5.1 uh, surround sound mix. It really worked out my system pretty good. Um, but Bordello of Blood, you know, has more of a, a good grain structure. It looks a little cleaner and sharper. Um, I can only assume that Demon Knight might have been done earlier on when the technology was still kind of in its early stages or when Universal was really just kind of starting to do that stuff, um, and that Bordello of Blood was done later, probably because it was just something they just figured out, we'll do it now and get it out of the way, and it was probably just, you know, done after the fact. So, um yeah, I mean, Bordello, it, it does look really good, and it sounds really good. Um, it does. You know, yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm happy with the – the thing is, is, like, watching that documentary on the disc, and I actually – I actually up, while we were talking, I uploaded a quick audio clip I want to play from it um, before we, you know, we, we cut off this whole thing. Hopefully that's okay. Um, Go for it. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to play this right now just so I can get out of the way. Bordello of Blood is an object lesson, I would say, in how not to make a movie. It was the only set in my life that I've ever worked on where I did not make friends with anybody from the cast. It's, it's a cult movie. It is a movie that people to this day tell me that they love watching. Uh, a lot of people that are involved with it, um, uh, you know, do consider it embarrassment. It's still a movie I, I have difficulty watching. Just because I, 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 I can't, I don't see the movie, I see everything that was happening on the other side of the camera. All right, so that's, that's the clip I want. Now, that, now see that? That's the, that's the beginning of that documentary. That's the, and you think at some point someone eventually is going to start saying nice things about this movie? That doesn't happen the entire time. <laughs> for, for 36 minutes, it's... True. it's it's shit talking the entire movie, and you're just kind of uh, Dennis Miller. Like Dennis Miller, uh, like I don't know if he's gonna have some kind of rebuttal and like try to come out and say, "Hey, wait a minute," but he seems to kind of agree the movie was crap too. So it's hard to say, "Yes, go out and get this movie." If you've never seen it or buy this disc, if you've never seen it, if you know the movie and you like it, then this is this is the end all be all disc for it. I mean, this is the one you're going to want to own. It's going to be the only, probably only opportunity you're ever going to get to have this with special features and a good picture and good audio. Um, I mean, the people who were involved in it can't even, with a straight face, say, "Oh yeah, we're proud of it." So, I can't either. I mean, I I would I would probably give it lower than you did. I probably would give it a one at this point. Although I that might go up considering all the horror stories I heard with Dennis Miller. Right. It might go up a little bit the next time. So. Well, over, overall, I'd give the disc rating a 6 out of 10. I think that there was a, a little bit more. I would have loved to have seen Del Dennis Miller make some comments about the film. Um, <clears throat> but I did enjoy Corey Feldman and everyone else's comments. Um, you know, I enjoyed the transfer. I thought the sound was good. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's not a total loss, like you said. It's a little disappointing that it didn't do better. But, you know, what can you say? Yeah, Chris, I well, want to thank you for coming. Yeah. I was going to yeah, say, I want to you know. thank you for coming on. I'm right here at the very end, but, um, you know, we should do this more often, and you de we definitely need to get you back on the on the air. At some point it will happen. Brandon, uh, Stephen, and I, I'm aware this is going to make the show go over, so I apologize in advance for those who are listening live. We will be back eventually, just I can't say when. Uh, we both got wrapped up in a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, Brandon started a new job. Stephen just had a baby. I started a new job. Uh, a lot of things happened in the course of like three weeks that just made us take a step back, which we thought 
was only going to be for a month, and then the next thing you know, it's two, two, almost three months later, where we haven't done a show, and we're actually, when we bring it back, we're looking at bringing it back on Wednesday, so if you were listening to us on Sundays, you know, we were talking about bringing it back on Wednesday to get it in between, uh, uh, the, you know, your show, and then uh, Todd and Dan's show as well, so we'll see what happens, I'm not guaranteeing anything in the near future, we did want to try to come back this month, but this month is already here, we don't have anything planned, anything lined up, so... Uh, eventually we'll be back, but uh, uh, Mike and I are talking about doing something once a month too. I don't know if the cat's out of the bag on that one yet, but it is now. So, but again, that's not fine tuned either. So, well, I'm I'm, I'm going to try to be more of a presence around here lately now that I'm settled in and what I've been doing. So, see what happens. Excellent, man. Well, we'll talk to you soon, and um, I'll hit you up on Facebook here when I'm done. <clears throat> I've got about right. three minutes of shit to do. All right, adios, amigo. All right, brother. Once again, that was Chris McGibbon host of Creep Show Radio, soon to be returning to Horror Society Radio. So make sure to head on over to shoutfactory.com to pick up your Blu-ray copy of Tales from the Crypt Presents, Bordello of Blood. It was a fantastic show this evening. We want to say thank you to Tatiana at After Dark Horror Fest for getting our guests this evening, Hank Braxton, Ron Carlson and Ivana Korob of A Natural, part of the After Dark Horror Fest 8 Films to Die For, which come out on October 16th, both in limited theatrical and VOD. Thank you to our friends at Metal Blade Records for providing us with Whitechapel, Our Endless War. I want to say thank you to our friends at Scream Factory for Bordello of Blood, and thank you to our friends at Cult Epics for Angst. Make sure to tune in next Tuesday when we cover the final film in the After Dark Horror Fest, eight films to die for, Re-Kill. Make sure to head over to HorrorSociety.com for all of your latest independent and major horror news. And keep an eye out for the latest issue of Living Dead Magazine. And until next week, ladies and gentlemen, this is the dead man, Michael Jones, your head undertaker from Horror Society and Living Dead Magazine, telling you all to...